Welcome to Systems Medicine! <laughs> Hello, let's take a nice deep breath. <sighs> and nice to see you. We already did two things. <laughs> so uh, today's uh, lecture is uh, about um, understanding inflammation and fibrosis. And like a major chunk of medicine deals with uh, excessive scarring called fibrosis. We discussed this also uh, problem with uh, last time with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, disease that kills you because your lungs turn to scar tissue, um, an incurable disease. And fibrosis appears all over with aging and also not with aging. Uh, almost every organ has this problem and its failures. So we're going to understand what is it, what is it and um, what, what's the general idea behind it. Uh, just to give an overview, in the course, we're now in the end of part two, this is the last lecture in part two on aging. And the first part was about um, uh, the, uh, feedback regulation in tissues and about uh, hormonal um, axes and autoimmunity, etc. And then it will end up, end up in the next lecture starting part three, which ha will have to do with evolution processes inside our body. It's like a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> So, uh, so what is this? What is this thing called inflammation? Why should we care? Um, in medicine, there's a kind of a universal sequence. Uh, it's you get an injury. Then there's inflammation, the liquid. And that can go in two directions. You can get healing or fibrosis. So when you remember, maybe as a, as a child, you're running and fell and you got an injury. It, it hurt. And then it maybe got a little hot and red. And then uh, soon enough, there was a scar there, kind of a superficial scar. Remember? And then after a couple of weeks, you look at it and there's nothing, no scar, tissue is perfectly healed. So that's injury, inflammation, healing. There's inflammation, there's scar, formed, and healing. But maybe also you were running and you fell a little harder or, uh, and you got a deeper wound and maybe you're still carrying a scar till today from that wound, I don't know. Uh, I certainly do, like I have one here. Uh, and that scar never goes away. That scar stays with you, with your friend. Maybe it talks to you when the seasons are changing. Like in the great novel War and Peace by Tolstoy. That's an example of fibrosis. That tissue is no longer a normal tissue, a part piece of skin with an epidermic layer. It's a different kind of thing. It's, it's uh, full of uh, collagen and fibers and it's a, it's a scar that, uh, that's permanent. That's fibrosis. So in the skin, it's maybe has some cosmetic side effects. But if your lung starts being filled with scars like this, that's, you lose your ability to breathe. We talked about that last time. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Or um, <coughs> it, it, basically, with aging, decline in organ function, nice deep sigh of relief. Uh, a lot of that decline is because the organs are, get covered with scars. So, for example, kidney function, a lot of it is because of this fibrosis in the filtering system of the kidney, glomerulosclerosis it's called, this is the name for it. In the liver, if you drink a lot of alcohol especially, uh, you, you injure your liver and liver turns into scar tissue. That's called cirrhosis, it's fibrosis of the liver. In the heart, if you get a heart attack, the th problem is that instead of re regenerating to a nice heart, it's you left with a scar, so you lose the heart function. That's fibrosis, um, and et cetera, et cetera. So fibrosis is a huge medical issue, and addressing it is kind of cutting across a lot of different diseases, and aging-related diseases in particular, but not only. So that's why it's so important. 
And also from a theoretical point of view, how can one healing process show two such different results? And so I want to get to the core of this uh, ability of a biological process to show two different results. And what do we know? When does healing occur and when fibrosis occurs? So the principle is that fibrosis occurs when the injury is uh, prolonged <coughs> or recurring, same place, or large. So there's some quantitative aspect that determines whether you go to healing or fibrosis. And fibrosis, excessive scar tissue. And um, the doctors know that if you want to avoid fibrosis, you better stop inflammation quickly. Like after surgery, or after a heart attack, or after stroke, doctors take big measures to stop inflammation. It could go to the extent of cooling the person down, giving anti-inflammatory medication, etc. And there is a, a limited time window of, let's say, two days, where if you stop the inflammation, you get healing. But if you go over this time window, nice deep sigh of relief, welcome, okay, I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you go over this time window, you're going to get fibrosis, even if you stop the inflammation. So it's a critical timing issue. So that's interesting. What is this time window? Where does it come from? How can we understand it? And once fibrosis starts, it's not like after three days you have the full form scar. It actually, when you look at the scar, it matures. It takes time to develop, develop, I'll explain, and reach its steady state. Because as we'll see, it's actually kind of a living tissue. It's not only dead fibers. And that process can take months to a year. So, okay, so there's a time window of days where stopping inflammation matters. But if you exceed the time window, you start a process that takes months. Even if you stop inflammation after five days, six days, it doesn't matter. So this um, long time scale of months for, let's call it scar maturation. Okay, so that means reaching the steady state of the fibrosis. And once it starts, it doesn't stop? Doesn't stop. And in medical situations, you'd love to have it stop in some medical situations. I want to say fibrosis, again, it's not a, only a bad thing. It's evolved like, uh, to, um, for good reasons. That we'll, we'll it's just a uh, disease states, as again and again in this course, a physiological process has good um, reason, gets somehow hijacked, diverted, exaggerated, mistimed to result in a disease process. So we saw that in different situations in autoimmune disease, uh, hijacking a mechanism for eliminating mutants. We saw that in aging where uh, removal of senescent cells gets saturated and you get um, a pro-injury, a pro-healing process turn into a damaging process, etc. So, um, so we want to understand these questions. What is the origin of this limited time window? And what is the origin of this long time scale? And can we, in principle, in principle, can we in principle understand how to avoid and even reverse fibrosis. So we'll talk about ideas how to do that. Again, based on the understanding. So you first wonder why, then you get to a picture from which you can make, uh, understand how to do things, right? It's always like that in science. You're curious. You want to know why the, why the bacteria don't grow ne next to that piece of mold in your Petri dish. You, see, oh, the mold secretes some chemical, ah, then you get to penicillin antibiotic. Or, in say, I would say that in science, the way it works is that you try to understand something. You, to do that, you do experiments where you try to control a piece of matter to do what you want. For example, 
why is it when you have a current that the compass needle changes? So, and then you start to play with it and you get to some control over matter and that control is then technology because now you can make for example an electric motor or an electric generator by moving a magnet through a piece of wire. So that's how curiosity leads you to do experiments where you gain some control over matter and that control is the start of technology. That's why it goes together. That's one way to think about it. Um, all right, so, um, so let's start to talk what is inflammation and what is fibrosis and then do some mathematical modeling to uh, understand uh, this decision and go for the, these objectives. Let's take a nice deep breath. So, inflammation, you know, is known already to the ancients, and they used a little Latin rhyme to remember what is inflammation. The Latin rhyme is, does anybody know it? It's a wubo, tumo, kalo, dolo. This is redness, swelling, heat and pain and also there's kind of a loss of function because the nerve and so one let's say, let's see if we understand it so what happens when there's an injury so we have here a nice uh, nice tissue now there's an injury here and some cells are, are damaged, right? So here underneath the tissue is a blood vessel. With some red blood cells. And these damaged tissues, they secrete chemicals that do something to the blood that's gonna give us this lubotumokalodolo. And uh, they basically, the two things happen in parallel. Okay. One is that they attract from the blood, they open up the blood vessel, and you have white blood cells that are immune cells come into the blood. Macrophages and neutrophils, and they're ready to eat the bacteria. So once you have this injury, the white blood cells come in and a lot of fluid actually flows in from the blood. It's full of also protective proteins. All kind of protective proteins like the complement system that kills bacteria in like 50 different ways and blood coagulation factors to seal up the wound. And so a lot of fluid goes in from the blood and cells, white blood cells. And that's the heat and the swelling it comes from that and the redness. So that's antibacterial defense and also maybe these macrophages, macro is big, phages eat. So these are big eating cells. They can also eat particles and any, any toxins you have in there. And, stuff like that. and uh, the other side wants to also seal this up to make a quickly what seal up to eat? to eat bacteria. Yeah. So uh, these cells, these macrophages, are able to, this is about the scale, they engulf it, so the bacteria goes into like a, a little vesicle inside the cell where they digest it. So they're much bigger. Yeah. And they also can track the bacteria. And so let's just talk about scales. So bacteria is about one micron, and these macrophages are about 10 microns. That's the typical size of a human cell. <coughs> um, okay, so the other part is uh, inside. I mentioned macrophages and fibroblasts in the last lecture too. Each tissue also has fibroblasts, which are fiber-making cells. And their job is to make nice fibers that keep the tissue kind of uh, mechanically fine and they're also 
um, help the cells in many ways. This is called extracellular matrix, these fibers. Extracellular matrix. Like collagen, collagen fibers, and a lot of other components. Okay. So these fibroblasts normally do that. But when there's an injury, they're activated to become super fibroblasts called myofibroblasts, named after Avi Mayo. <laughs> and myofibroblasts, Mayo is muscle, they have properties of muscle, they have fibers that they can do force, they can kind of heal things up like that. They are super muscle bound fiber secretors. Okay, so they secrete a lot of this. That, that's a problem in fibrosis, right? They make the fibrosis, they're the fiber making cells. They make a lot of these fibers. So we have, that's inflammation in a, in a nutshell. You have the immune arm, macrophages, neutrophils, eh, that come in to eat the bacteria and clean up the debris cells. And the, fiber, the myofibroblasts, which are making the, laying down the fibers that make the scar. Okay, that's inflammation. <coughs> And fibrosis is a state where, oh, I should say, in normal healing, normal healing, you get this um, influx of macrophages from the blood. So the blood has these pre-macrophages called monocytes. They go in and become macrophages. You get a lot of macrophages for a few days. You get myofibroblasts. You make the scar from when you were a kid, but then it shuts itself down. The myofibroblasts and the macrophages die, and the scar is digested. Macrophages, by the way, also like to digest the scar themselves. So the fibroblasts build it, macrophages digest it. And, and, and cells of the tissue, in an organized way, replicate, and everything is healed. So normally, these cell types, they go away after Let's say a healing process about two weeks. It's also not very short, but that's a typical healing process. But fibrosis is when it, they don't go away, and you end up with, instead of a tissue again, you end up with the injury full of fibers like that, and also some myofibroblasts and some macrophages stuck in there. That's fibrosis. Did I explain myself? Okay, take a nice deep breath. <sighs> Do the myofibroblasts still make more fibers? Can you ask me again, please? Do the myofibroblasts that are stuck in there make more fibers? The question is, in the fibrotic state, do the myofibroblasts keep making more fibers? So uh, the way we look at it is yes, they keep making more fibers, and the macrophages keep digesting them, but you reach a steady state of high fibers. And if there's no macrophages in the fibrosis, it's even higher. And by the way, just another little detail. The macrophages secrete these little scissors called metallo, matrix metalloproteases, or proteins, that cut up this uh, extracellular matrix. And the fiber, myofibroblast, it's like rock, paper, scissors. They make rocks, which is anti-scissors. So they stop the degradation. It's like a... And also, the regular cells of the tissue make these scissors. So but at a low level. So this ECM is constantly being remodeled. Uh, and as again, another theme in this uh, class, our bodies are constantly being remodeled. Bone is being remodeled, joints, tissue, extracellular matrix, it's all, the steady state is dynamic. All right, so we learned what is fibrosis and time window and the time scale of fibrosis, myofibroblasts and extracellular matrix and macrophages. So now we're ready to, um, Thing. Okay. What mechanism takes the myofibroblasts out? What happens? What, what, what mechanism take them out? remove the myofibroblasts? Yeah. So that's part of the question that we'll ask. Okay. Uh, we'll see that they need some survival signals. And when those signals are gone, they, they kill themselves. Like uh, many cells do that too, and macrophages too. Yeah. Uh, 
Sorry, you couldn't hear. How does it matter? I mean, I'm, 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 the same you said when they die, they go away. How? When they die, mm -hmm. ah, I see. Take. Yeah, so cells, death, there's different ways. The way they, they do it, nice deep sigh of relief, <laughs> is called apoptosis or programmed cell death. And the cell um, activates a very programmed way to cut up its DNA, wrap itself up in a membranous kind of set of plastic bags, and call in macrophages. Even every tissue has its tissue resident macrophages ready to eat up apoptosed cells very effectively. So that's, that's a n normal way. But in some cases where you don't have good control, you have necrosis, which is a messy death, and they spill out their contents and make more inflammation because uh, if you see a piece of DNA floating around, that's maybe a sign that there's bacteria or viruses, and so that's in, in th and this necrosis can cause more inflammation in the problem. So that's part of the initial signals here. Welcome. We can take a nice deep sigh of relief. Yeah. <sighs> All right, so um, we need to understand uh, in more detail. So we're going to talk now, switch to talking about the cell circuit working in here. Cell circuit working in here. So the, the big players in, 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 in inflammation fibrosis, okay. the field of inflammation is a massive field in biology and medicine. And it's one of the fields in biology and medicine that is very detailed focused. So there's not a lot of big picture in this field. And there's a lot of molecules and states. So macrophages can be M1, M2, and M1. So what I'm going to do for you is to pick the, what I think is the essential important fa factors in order to build a conceptual picture. And then there's masses of additional details that, uh, that exist. But I think they're less cr critical for the, our question, our question, the time window, long time scales, and what you can do about fibrosis. So the way we're going to look at fibrosis is there's a circuit of cells here, and the myofibroblasts, F is going to be myofibroblasts, and M are the macrophages, so these will be our two cell types. Myofibroblasts that get activated to lay down the fiber, and the macrophages come from the blood to fight bacteria. And what's going to, what you'll see is that the reason that they don't die is because they support each other with the signals that are essential for their proliferation and, and survival. Those are called growth factors. So in, in human cells, in order not to die, in order, in order to keep uh, growing, cells need growth factors. These are small proteins. They have receptors. When they have it, they know to divide. When they don't have it, they don't divide, they die. So that's like a permission to live signal in our body for, for cells that are. So these growth factors are. Um, they could be, they're very cell type specific, often, etc. So, M supplies the growth factor needed for F. So, it secretes it, and F has receptors that get it. And I, I want to make it, I'm going to draw it differently. So anyway. uh, yeah, that's, that's the way, all right. So, this is, no, call it C1. It's C1, yeah. And F makes a different growth factor for macrophages. This is called PDGF, and this is called CSF for aficionados people. So they keep each other alive. And another interesting thing that happens in the circuit is that F also secretes this growth factor. In other words, F has, this is very interesting, the fibroblasts secrete their own growth factor. Not only, and this is an experimental fact, and this is called autocrine loop. That's just a name for cell secreting the factor it needs. Um, and both these cell types divide, of course. Where do, I, where do I know all this? Because all these interactions are very well characterized. But in particular, I want to point out to a paper by Uslan Medjitov, who's an immunologist in Yale, is a really great scientist. And he took, in order to 
simplify the thing that happens in the living tissue, he took just these cells um, in a plate and studied this circuit. So he could, in the plate, make them grow, die, and measure what they're secreting, and all the rate constants, the secretion rate, the growth rate. So we know for the circuit, at least from a plate situation, which is not like inside the body, but gives us some order of magnitude, what the circuit is quite accurately, experimentally. Okay, so I'll tell you what the parameters are, et cetera. But it's good for understanding conceptual features of the circuit, but in the body it'll be additionally different, of course, but just I think the concepts might survive into the body too. That's the, in it's called in vitro this approach, right? So we have this Latin, today is a Latin day, right? In vivo means inside the living organism, and in vitro means on a piece of glass, basically, like plastic. And we also have in silico, which means computer simulation. And we have in uh, envelopo, which is the back of an envelope calculation, like what we'll do here. <laughs> <laughs> I just made that up. <laughs> These are the four major tools of systems medicine. <laughs> All right, so this is our circuit, our myofibroblast macrophage circuit uh, in which they secrete. Now, there's something also very important I need to tell you is they make these growth factors. How are the growth factors removed? So uh, there's something very interesting that happens across biology. When you have a cell like this macrophage receiving its C2 with the C2 receptor, which causes signal cascade to make, let's say, M cells divide. When it binds it, it also drags it into the cell, not unlike the process where it eats bacteria, but a little bit different. It drags the receptor with the C2 into the cell and recycles it. That's called endocytosis, which means into the cell. So that's very strange, because you have your receptors and your signal. And you basically re reduce your own signal by eating up the signal and the receptor on your cells. So, that's, so it's kind of a biochemical detail. You see it in system after system after system. And you ask yourself, why? So we're going to understand it actually has a really important systems level function in the circuit. It wouldn't work without, without it, basically, because it's kind of a feedback mechanism. So, so I'm going to draw that like this. Uh, these F cells eat up their own signal, and the M cells eat up their own signal by endocytosis. The growth signals are always positive? The growth signals in this circuit are always positive, and sometimes there are signals that stop cells from dividing, like um, somatostatin. No, the, what, which is, what is it? Yeah, it's like, what's, I just, there's a signals, famous signals also stop cells. Somatostatin, I think, and TGF beta, all kinds of signals like that. Yeah, so there's, there's two, uh, there's, a, there's a language, the cells speak to each other, which by the way we don't understand so much, it's like we, for example, a lot of these growth factors like PDGF, there's PDGF alpha, beta, and the men, many of them have many isoforms, like BMP, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the cells somehow know how to pick up from this chemical soup the information they need. And the way they do that is a subject of research, it looks like they have Sometimes they have these many kind of receptors, and the receptors can dimerize and only pick up a certain projection from the signal, concentrations from the signal, you can see. So they have like tuned specificities. And so they have a language we need to understand. Why it's so important to understand? Because suppose we, we have like a, a gum disease, like and gum disease, and we want to make the bone there grow again so you don't lose your teeth. We want to tell the bone to grow. The way we do it right now is hitting it like on, a, on the head with the one big like, molecule that's most active or something. But inside the bone, they actually use like a, a subtle language. It's made of a dozen different chemicals in the right space. We don't understand that subtlety. So there's something very interesting to understand. But, uh, in vitro, it's nice. It's really two molecules. Inside the body, it's probably a whole language with adjectives, metaphors, poetry. They're like talking to each other, figuring each other out, and they have like words for different situations. And it's important to somehow 
figure out um, what they're saying. Okay, so um, this is going to be our circuit, and we're going to try to mathematically figure out what it does in order to understand the decision between fibrosis and healing, based, for example, on um, inflammation duration. And inflammation. Uh, is a big influx of macrophages into the circuit. So you make some fibroblasts in the beginning, my fibroblasts will be, but then inflammation pours 10 times more macrophages than normal into the tissue. That's uh, okay. So, uh, any questions? Now is the time. When I find myself in times of swelling, swelling redness, heat, and pain, there will be an answer, inflammation again. And though it may be itchy, I know that it's there to defend. There will be an answer, inflammation again. Inflammation again, inflammation again. There will be an answer, inflammation again. If the injury is transient, you know, a little scar will form in me. And then it's going to vanish, let it be. But if the injury is recurrent, there'll be fibrosis, can't you see? Mama, help me. <laughs> let it be, let it be. Thank you. Thank you for your singing. That was the first in our class, I think. No, maybe not the first. Okay, so we want to understand this circuit. Let's do it. Um, I think it's time to erase this. Any, any questions about this uh, cartoon of information? Um, you want to uh, make a picture? Is the blood vessel going into the page? Or what? Ah, yeah, so I attempted to make a blood vessel that's kind of, um, you know, like like that, like that, and I try to open up to, to show what's inside the blood vessel. So, like, I took a little piece out of that. I learned that from uh, online like videos on medicine. They like have this great way of drawing. I just love it. Like, they draw it much quicker than I do. Somehow, I don't understand. They go, like, oh, how do they do that? Yeah. The question is, can you incorporate external signals like medicine, you mean, or? No, like, like the external injury, how does it uh, Oh yeah. Erode yeah, let's, let's talk about the external, yeah. It'll be like initial conditions, basically. Uh, when you have an injury, you don't have tissue, but you have a little bit of myofibroblasts and macrophages, that's initial condition, and then inflammation pours a lot of macrophages in. That's how we'll model this. Make sense? So we model this area, which has basically no cells now, only a little bit of myofibroblasts and macrophages. Must have some injury to the blood vessel? Ah, no, you don't. You don't need injury to the blood vessel because these molecules go by diffusion, and when they reach the blood vessel, the blood vessel says, ah! and like opens up, and it's designed to do that. This is part of the job of blood vessels is to know about in inflammation. It's not, if you get a uh, breach in your blood vessel, blood will flow into here. That's bleeding, right? And then there'll be a lot of coagulation, which means the uh, emergency stopping of the, of the breach in the blood vessel by both proteins that make special fibers and little cells called platelets that go in like, so there's like, there's a whole injury to blood vessel cascade, but, uh, yeah. A question about the, the timing. Um, how do you form kind of this rule of thumb, if you will, about timing and scar resolution regarding inflammation? Because for some things like bone healing, they say you know how to take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, for example. Ah, yeah. I see, I see. You are saying for some situations, if 
inflammation can be prolonged without fibrosis. In other cases, yeah. So I'm sure that's the case. I mean, so this will be like an order of magnitude from several emergency medicine situations. But maybe other cases longer. It's like stroke, heart attack, surgery. Mm -hmm. kind of so there's like a, a big class of cases where you, that's the time. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there's other cases where, for example, in, feet, in the fetus, if there's an injury in the fetus, there's no fibrosis and no inflammation. They're able to understand that there's not going to be bacterial infection because inside, in utero, and they, they, <laughs> they have, and that's a, a hint that you can bypass this somehow. So that, and also um, regeneration is another case where if some organs can regenerate and then there's another kind of response, heal, uh, which is like you cut off part of the liver and it can regenerate, or mice, until, week se until one week of age, if you cut a piece of the heart, it regenerates, and after one week of age, it stops regenerating and becomes fibrotic, like in us. So th there's a balance between the ability to regenerate and fibrosis and healing, which is tuned probably for every organ according to the uh, evolutionary situation. So that's I think, it shows how tunable it is, maybe. And we'll understand that in the circuit. Like, okay. I think. Well, yeah. So I, I'll have a question, okay. I think, yeah. the circuit. Okay. I'll All right. So why don't you write it down, yeah. and I'll like, I'm already excited to hear it. So, um, <laughs> All right. Now we're going to do some lovely little uh, mathematical analysis. Uh, and uh, so in order to explain the concepts, I'm going to start just by pretending there's only fibroblasts. And then we add the mic microphages. Okay, so. Fibroblasts only. And so we have a circuit where fibroblasts secrete this C1 and they make them grow and they also eat it up. And so they're proliferating and the C1 is going to help them proliferate. So that we need an equation for the concentration of the growth factor C1, which is called PDGF alpha in the case where the autocrinate and PDGF beta in the other case. So the, and we're going to write it like this. With the secretion rate, we'll say, is A times F. So A secretion rate, typically hundreds of molecules per cell per minute. That's, that's what, uh, that's a typical. And one, C, one molecule in C1. N not exactly. The, the probability of proliferation goes up with the amount of molecules binding the receptors in a kind of usually linear and then saturating way, but sometimes less speed. Um, and then, so this is production, autocrine production, self production. And then it's also eaten up by the same cells. So this will be our endocytosis rate. Endocytosis. And we're also going to allow a, a regular degradation. That's to say, if there's no cells around, we're going to need this degradation. We're going to need this degra degradation. We're going to need this time scale in order to get rid of the C1. This is a probability per unit time for molecules to. And this is, so I said this is about 100 molecules per cell per minute. This is about 1,000 molecules per cell per minute. And this is about, this takes hours to days. So endocytosis is much, much more than degradation of these things, which actually is, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. So if you have a source of this growth factor, it's going to diffuse, and its range is going to be determined by how many target cells it has. The more target cells it has, the shorter it's going to diffuse before it gets eaten up by the cells. So it's a scalab scalable range for cell-cell signal. Beautiful, really. And um, I'm kind of in love with endocytosis. So then we have our, our cell, our cell concentration. Okay, so we're going to model it like this. So we'll have proliferation times F. So this is how we proliferate. And its proliferation is activated by this C1. So this is cell division, proliferation division. Yeah. How is it possible that endocytosis is a lot like a, a 
Yeah. How is it? You mean, how is it uh, possible? Yeah, so the steady state would mean that, so if we just had, uh, oh, we're going to calculate the steady state soon. You'll see that. What it means is that uh, um, there's still a steady state, but it's, uh, it's contrastive C1 is, isn't that high. Because it goes down, 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 let's say, to one-tenth, and then one-tenth times a thousand equals a hundred. So it goes down, down, down. That's great. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. By all steps, it seems like you missed the line, right? The line from M to C. Yeah, that's right. So I'm going to talk only from only fiberglass now. So I'm going to pretend there's only fiberglass. Actually, in the plate, I can do that. Just put fiberglass. And Ruslan Medjidov did that. So what I'm going to tell you now is experimentally graphs of the solutions we'll see. So this yeah. <laughs> Why does endocytosis depend on C1? Because uh, in order for the cell to eat up C1, C1 has to collide with the cell receptor and pick it up. So and There is no any saturation in this process? There is saturation, so a better equation would be C1 over K1 plus C1, which is like receptor binding with K is the affinity. And you can do that, and you get basically the same results. This math is a little more difficult. So C1 I is only small? Yeah, so we're going to assume that C1 is uh, smaller than K, which is not a bad approximation. So that's absolutely true. Every process in biology saturates. What else? Great question. Yeah, so I think re really, uh, I think I, you guys are awake. It's always, it's always. And then there's the cell death. So we have death, and we have divisions, proliferation. And now we can play with this equation. All right, so we have two different equations. Now, this takes uh, days. So uh, if you stop making the growth factor, you put this fibroblast to the plate, they're going to die within days. So this equation has days time scale. This equation has hours time scale. And so we can assume that this is in steady state. Let's say we can put this equals to 0 by assuming that over hours, f doesn't change much. As usual, this is our trick as usual. So if f is changing over days, and hours is in an hour, which is the time it takes to endocytosis, f is constant over this hour. Right? So we can do that, and then we can solve this equation. And what we find is that C1 is its production rate divided by its removal rate. So this, this is a C1 well, looks like this, and it, when f is very large, it's just it's the ratio between its production and endocytosis rate. So that's the answer. It just reaches a steady state, and if there's if there's less cells, there's less C1 because they're making it. If there's zero cells, there's no C1. If there's a lot of cells, there's a balance between the two. So we have our little. So C1 is measuring cells for us. So now that's how f know how many cells of themselves there are. This endocrine loop. Now we can plug this in to here and get an equation for the cells. And do that, and we see that EF dt equals P1, AF divided by EF plus gamma, times F minus D1 F. Now I want to understand this equation. Okay. And I'm going to use, in this lecture, I'm going to use two graphical methods that are really uh, very uh, useful for understanding equations, because they turn the math into graphics, and from graphics you have the intuition, and you also have the solutions. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say this is our rate of proliferation, and this is our rate of death. I'm just going to plot them. So I'm going to put here cells here on the x-axis, and here I'm going to put here, let's say, death. How much death there is. The more cells there are, the more death there is. D1F, it's just a straight line. Do you agree with me? Now I'm going to plot proliferation. Now why is it important to plot it? Because when the lines cross, it's a cell density in which death equals proliferation. And that is this fixed point. That is where the steady state is, because death equals proliferation. So these crossing points. And this technique is called rate plot. So crossing points are the fixed points. So we, let's, we need to draw a curve that looks like this. So this curve is a straight line times this. So it's a 
it's a straight line times a saturating line. At low f, both of them are straight lines. So straight line times trans line is f squared. It's a parabola. At large f, it's a constant times a square line. So it's just a straight line. No way around it. That's the way proliferation looks. And where is the crossing point? There's one here and one here. When there's zero cells, you obviously stay at zero cells because there's no growth factors. There's no cells to make more cells. You stay there. <coughs> Let's look at this point here. If I have a little bit less than this point, death is greater than proliferation. Therefore, I go to less cells and I slow down to here. If I have a little bit more cells, proliferation is greater than death. I go to infinity. Therefore, this is called an unstable fixed point. We saw that, I think, in the glucose system, too. So this system has two fixed points, stable, death, off state, and unstable point goes to infinity. This obviously cannot work, because you don't want your F cells to go to infinity. You have to have some control. So we need to add something here. Is that question so far? Yeah. Um, uh, the axis, both the axes, those are uh, usually a, a concentration basis, like the, this axis? volume basis. This is uh, this yeah. So this can say cells per uh, milliliter, like that. And uh, and this is a this is concentration per unit time. It's like great. So my question has to do with the control volume. Uh, so I understand that you're doing the mass balance on some control volume. How do you define the control volume? One nice thing about endocytosis is the control volume defines itself. So that if you think of a cell sending out these signals, signals are going to degrade in a way that depends on how many other cells there are to eat them up. And that defines a natural scale of around 100 microns, 10 cell diameters. So you can say the tissues have this natural diffusion endocytosis scale. Does that answer your question? Does that, so does that somehow come back to kind of basically regulate what happens in uh, in a fetus versus a, an adult? So of course, fetus and adult are, are much bigger than this hundred micron scale, but um, like yeah, and tissue basis has made a lot of, of a lot of these elementary volumes. So you can say there's like a local flavor to cell circuits that that will encompass. 10 by 10 by about 1,000 cells mm -hmm. as a basic unit of diffusion in endocytosis, mm -hmm. order of magnitude. And that's interesting to think about. And again, that's unexplored territory as far as I know. Like, the ramifications, because everything here I'm talking is without space. But if you think about space like that, that's very interesting. To think tumors and all kinds of stuff like that, they have a spatial aspect. So like, what's this length scale that's relevant? And I guess and also the communication between different length scales. Yeah. Is also crucial. But I'm not going to touch that. And I don't even know what to say about it. OK, so we need to add, add something to stabilize. Because we, because what, what's going on? <laughs> Cells make their own growth factor. So what, you expect them to stop? They make more, and they grow more. They make more, so what's going to stop them, right? What's going to stop them? We need some higher authority. So the higher authority is, comes from experimental observation. That these fibroblasts in plates, in tissues, etc., they grow, 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 and they know they have like a, a maximum density they can reach. They, uh, it's called the carrying capacity. So when you put them on a plate, for example, they grow, 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 and make a continuous layer like that. And they don't overgrow. They don't make two, 3D stuff. And in the body also, they have a way to, uh, it's like a limiting resource that limits them. And the way that's modeled is you take your pro proliferation rate, let's put it here, and you say that proliferation is fine until the cells reach some density, uh, we'll call it 1, these units, so it's, it usually you put F over K, but we're going to normalize that out, so some density F equals 1, where they stop growing. And the experiment that shows this very nicely 
in this paper is that you take the proliferation rate of these F cells as a function of their density. And it just goes down like this and extrapolates to this carrying capacity. Just like the formula. The formula comes from old times uh, looking at animal growth. Animals make babies in proportion to their own number, but the uh, species reach a carrying capacity where they can't, there's not enough food or there's not enough space or something like that. And that's the classical term from ecology. Turns out also to describe very nicely experimentally what happens when cells reach a very high density. Cells that care about that. Ma we'll see macrophages don't have a carrying capacity, fibroblasts do. So I'm going to add here another piece of the puzzle. Fibroblasts can't exceed, this, this little thing is let's say like a, a ceiling or something. They can't exceed this carrying capacity. When you add that into the equations, the death curve stays the same. But the proliferation curve is our thing times this 1 minus f. And that changes the proliferation curve to look like this. f equals 1 or f equals k or the carrying capacity. It goes down to 0 there. And now it has a shape of a hill with a, with a dent on the left. And that creates another fixed point. And this fixed point is stable because if you're here, death is greater than proliferation and you flow to less cells. So this circuit, when there's too few cells, they crash. And when you're more than enough cells, you go to a stable steady state where they make their own growth factor, but they don't exceed the carrying capacity, etc. So they have a high, a, an off state and a high state and an unstable state. So they call it F high, F unstable, and zero. And I just want to plot for you what that looks like. Uh, experimentally, <coughs> the experiment is to take a plate, actually to take 96 plates in a 96 well plate, which is standard biology kind of, you have this 96 well plate, I should have brought for you, 96, 8 by 12. And in each one, you seed with your puppet different amounts, initial amounts of F cells, fibroblasts, my, um, what's called METs, mouse embryonic fibroblasts. And you ask what happens. So you look, this is time, and this is how many cells there are. And suppose you seed just a little bit of cells, they crash. But if you seed more cells, they go like this. And if you seed more cells, they go like this. More cells, they go like this. More cells, they go like this. Okay. So, and this is the boundary. So this is F unstable. And this point here, this is F high. So no matter how much you seed, and this could be a logarithmic scale, you can seed 100 times more cells. And they all go into the same the time scale, by the way, let's say a week. Okay, so the cells are dividing and dying on a scale of days. And when they're here, they're still dividing and dying. They just create their own growth factor, eat it up. Uh, and the carrying capacity is, I mean, is higher. You can prove that you can push them higher. They stay a little bit below the carrying capacity, as you see here. They're a little bit below their carrying capacity. All right, now this feature is called by stability. So it's one equation, two stable states, depending on the initial condition. So it's like you remember your initial condition, uh, whether it was low or high, and um, uh, and there's like a, a basin of attraction for the high and a basin of attraction for the low state and that's called by stability. Okay, that's going to be, turn out to be very important for us. Uh, just to digest what I just uh, told you, I'd like you to turn to someone sitting next to you or behind you and 
ask them a question or listen to their question and discuss this. So please enjoy. Clarify for the entire class. Yeah. Uh, I was asking about uh, the receptor on the fibroids. So yeah. You probably have a changing amount of receptors per cell, or, or maybe it's stable. I don't know. Mm -hmm. How it does that? So the question is: different fibroblast cells have different numbers of receptors on their surface, and that's that's true. There's a big variation in the receptors in, among individual cells in the same condition. How would that affect this situation? And that's a, that's a good, very good question uh, because um, you can think maybe so that more receptors will grow more than other cells. Luckily, this property is not a, it, it could be a mutation and that, that's bad. We need, but it, it, usually it's a noise thing because of the stochastic nature of making these proteins. And then the daughter cells will no longer have the, an advantage and that, that tends to average out. In fact, in this paper or in another paper that Miri Adler, so I want to just recognize this work is Miri Adler. Miri Adler is sitting over here. Woo. She's at the end of her PhD. She's a postdoc, actually. And she's going to do a postdoc. Uh, so uh, Miri Adler, in a paper in PNAS 2018, uh, analyzed this question mathematically and to show that in most situations, that is, uh, you get, the average is a good approximation if you're interested in average behavior. Did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, more? Yeah. yeah I have yeah. a question. You talked about the carrying capacity or yeah. proliferation. Yeah. But is there a similar mechanism that could like, cap the death of the death rate? The death yeah. rate? Is, does death have a carrying capacity? Yeah. yeah. So that's a question I haven't considered, and my intuition is that it, I don't see why it should, because uh, death has a big like a weapon that's very tough. 
So I would guess, um, and you can definitely think of situations like, um, like if, a, if, a, if the ceiling fell on me, where cells would die very quickly. So, but I uh, think about that. The proliferation is limited by many factors. It could be contact inhibition. It could be another other growth factors. The body supplies and the, you run out of them locally because you're too dense. And in fact, Ruslan Mejitov has experimentally shown how to, in certain situations, you can change the carrying capacity by adding growth factor, other growth factors. So by extrapolating this out, you can measure experimentally what the carrying capacity is, right? You can, this is proliferation as a function of density. So. And you can determine, do cells have a carrying capacity? Did I answer your question? Okay, really, really I have to think about that. Other questions? Yeah. Basically, the so your comment is that this already gives us a flavor of where we're going. So if a large injury makes it to this region, it becomes self-sustaining. Whereas it's in this region, it vanishes. So that's, that's the heart of the phenomenon I want to describe. I'm going to add macrophages now and see the full enchilada. Okay, let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> All right, good. Um, uh, thank you for those questions. So uh, we're going to add the macrophages, and now deal also mathematically, I love it, two cell types, two growth factors, four differential equations. Can we do it? And now we, uh, okay. and now we can't use the rate plot anymore because it's, we need F and M. It becomes like a mess. So we need another graphic concept that I want to teach you. And I love. So I'm going to erase uh, some of this stuff. Um, so, uh, so we have to. Um, so we have our f equations, and now we want to add m. So, as as already one person said here, to C1 we have to add the contribution that m also makes it. That's all we need to do for C1, and for f, just this additional arrow here. So M makes it. M makes it, and therefore, I need to add that here. And now our, uh, our C1 also depends on M and on F. Can you explain myself? And now we need to add, add equations for C2. So this is who makes C2? It's F. That means that macrophages also grow and reduce in, in a larger time scale? Can you repeat? Does that mean that macrophages also proliferate and die in a, in oh, a larger time scale? Why can I do this quasi steady state assumption? Uh, correct. The cell types in general divide and die over days. And the uh, growth factors in general get eaten up in minutes to hours. So we can do separation of time scale. Okay. Of course, you can also solve on the computer without this assumption. Just all these different equations and see that it's okay. You put it in the so. Yeah, growth factors are little proteins that the cells uh, make and secrete out. And then they float around and then they bind receptors, which are also proteins like sensors. And then they cause... Uh, something to happen inside the cell and are eaten up by the cell. The trading proteins <laughs> are very intimate. So DC2, so we, it's made by fibroblasts and eaten up by macrophages and there it also has its own degradation term and macrophage proliferates thanks to C2 and dies. And actually, macrophages do not have a carrying capacity. They don't have a carrying capacity. How do you know that? If you do this experiment, put in macrophages, their proliferation is not affected by their own density. So in this circuit, it's only carrying capacity on one cell type. That's, again, experimentally the case. And we know that that's true because in inflammation, the amount of macrophages dumped in from the blood makes their numbers in the, t in, they're in the tissue, but then their numbers go up by tenfold more 
And they have no problem with that. You can make more and more. Of course, and then there's some become a neutron star of macrophages, and, but we're far from that limit. <laughs> and most of the fibrosis is fibers. Let's not forget that. Yeah. All right, so we have four equations, and we have um, and we have um, <coughs> we want to solve them. So um, so we're going to solve them. And uh, we're not going to be afraid. We're going to solve them. So we want first to, to look at what we're not going to be afraid. <coughs> we're going to solve them. And uh, so now we do my, my, my macrophages plus fibroblasts. Is that the equation like the same for MNF? Yeah, it's right. You're right. Thank you. So that's just a typo. Uh, but they're similar. So uh, let's plot, let's calculate C2 uh, at steady state. So C2 is just going to be B, the production divided by the removal. Okay. And now let's look at this equation. And I'm going to teach you a nice graphic trick. So in order to solve this situation, see what's going to happen, what's happening. I'm going to draw the phase plane. What is the phase plane? On this axis, I'll plot how many fibroblasts there are, and here are how many macrophages there are. Okay, so each, I can put in the plate a little bit of fibroblasts and macrophages, and then see what happens to them. What happens to them? Like, and how they flow on this plane. So I wanna, that's what I want to do. I want to see how they flow on this plane. And important things, and a useful thing is to ask, when is it that ma macrophages don't change? And that is called a null cline. It's going to be a line, a relationship between M and F, where macrophages don't change. I'm going to plot it, and then, and then I'm going to plot the other null cline, is the line where fibroblasts don't change. And where these lines cross, that's the fixed point, right? Because both fibroblasts and microfibrillas don't change. So I'm going to plot these two null clines. That's a general technique in dynamical system analysis. How many people have ever used null clines? Third of the. So what is the null cline for the MDT equals zero? What is the null cline? So we're going to write it out. P two M times this thing. minus D2L equals zero. And to sol solve this, I can notice that either M equals zero, so if it's not, I can erase this M, or M and F satisfy a linear relationship in which um, M equals something times F plus gamma two over um, something, it's uh, E2. So it's going to be some number that's made out of all these numbers plus a small number because gamma is much smaller than E. So it's a line. It looks like this. This is the null line, the M, dt equals zero. On this line, M doesn't change. Above this line, M changes and actually flows down, and below the line flows up. Because if there's uh, a lot of M, it eats up its own growth factor and goes down. If there's a little bit of M, so this line it divides the plane into situations where we know what M is doing. And now we can do the same for the other null line, the FDT equals zero. But we already did some work for just the fibroblasts, so we know that, for example, F equals zero, solve this equation, because F equals zero, you have zero. So F equals zero and M equals zero are null clines, and the off state is a fixed point. So we have no cells, you're going to stay like that, that's obvious, right? No cells. And then we have the other fixed point. So if I keep M equals zero, I have the other. Uh, fixed points that I calculated already. They are fixed points. 
if m equals zero. We already know that because we calculate just the fiberglass circuit alone. Yeah, bicycle. So the knock line does something like this. It goes through these fixed points and then it goes up like this at the carrying capacity. And the reason it goes up like this is because this one minus f term makes the non-client diverge up. And you get this nice fixed point. And this, this is another fixed point where these non-clients are. So you have, this is the fixed point structure of this, uh, of this differential equation. And right, I plugged in to C1, I plugged this M plus F thing here. So this gives you um, uh, the solution to the null line. And I know it starts high because when F is zero, when F is zero and I have a M here and it goes like M one minus F equals F basically. So you have like M goes like F over one minus F and that's the divergence at A. And then there's another AF. So there's, it starts high, goes down, and goes up. So yeah. it starts from zero, it has to cross. How, how do you get this fixed point? This fixed point yeah. is because m equals zero and f equals zero are null points. Uh, right? That's, so there's f equals zero is a null line. Because there, if f is zero, f doesn't change. If f is zero, this. and then you have these extra null points. Did I explain myself? Yeah. And now I can fill in the arrows. In this part, m goes down. In this part, m goes up. In this part, f goes like this. In this part, f goes like this. In this part, here, uh, f goes like this. And, and I can figure out what is going on. I can draw all these arrows. And I'm going to do that for you. And we'll get our flow. And our flow looks like this. In this region here, things flow to the state. This state is stable, on state. This state here is stable, off state. These are unstable. And here, this is stable only if m equals 0. And if there's only fiberglass, this is stable. Otherwise, you go to that state. And when the results are on the x-axis. Yeah, here. And what we see in the system is the following. In this region here, if there's a little bit of f, and no matter how many m you have, you flow, things crash. So if in my wound, I have a not enough F cells, you can have as many M cells as I want, they're going to vanish. They can't support themselves. But if I'm in this region, they support each other and they go up to a state where there's a lot of M and a lot of F. A lot of M. And, and this state here, we're going to say, is the healing state. Because after the M and F do their thing, they crash to zero, they vanish. That's like, um, that's like what happens when you get this card that vanishes. Soon we'll talk about this card. And if you're here, this state we're going to call fibrosis because this is a self-sustaining state. If we talk about the fibers, the fibroblasts make the fibers and the macrophages remove the fibers. These are fibers called extracellular matrix, right? In this state, um, the fibers eventually, in the tissue, also uh, removes them with the scissors. Eventually, are vanish. Here, they're constantly made and removed. So there's fibers in this state and not in this state. In this state, there's only fibroblasts. So there's going to be ma a lot of fibers here. This is like super fibrosis. Only fibroblasts. Okay. 
And this whole region here is the basin of attraction to helium. And this whole region here is the basin of attraction to fibrosis. This line here is called separatrix. Separatrix in Latin. <laughs> it's a Latin lecture. It's the boundary between the two bases of attraction. So this is what multi-stability actually looks like in a phase plane. And when you add the arrows in, it's called a phase portrait. Because in one snapshot, you can tell the whole personality of this. Uh, you can see all the arrows what each initial condition is going to do. It's like the wind blowing, where the wind blows the dynamics. Now let's analyze what happens with injury. So we said that transient injury leads to healing and prolonged injury leads to fibrosis. Let's try to understand that dynamic. So, in order to model inflammation, I'm going to add here a source term that adds macrophages. Because so when there's inflammation, the blood vessels dilate, there's swelling, heat, pain, redness, macrophages come in. So this, this is going to be our pulse of inflammation. We're going to do a brief, we're going to compare a brief uh, inflammation. So we have our I of T is going to be, let's say, go on for up for two days and then go away. So we managed to stop the inflammation early. Where the body senses there's no more pathogens, no bacteria around, everything's fine. Transient injury. So let's analyze what happens. We have the injury, and so we initially we have some initial condition where there's a few myofibroblasts and a few macrophages in the tissue. That's our initial, that's our initial condition. This, we're talking about this little piece of tissue, now there's a hole in the tissue, and there's a few myofibroblasts and macrophages at t equals zero. And now the blood vessels get the signal, and quickly, within minutes, they pour in a lot of mac a lot of a lot of uh, macrophages. Yeah, they, they're in the yeah. tissue and they get activated to myofibroblasts by the injury signal, so there's a few of them around there. If the inflammation is brief, they're, go the, they're going to divide a little bit and try to send signals to each other. They're going to divide a little bit, but it's not going to work. And they're going to crash to zero. That's what's going to happen. So if I plot here macrophages, they go up and down. If I plot fibroblasts, they go up and down. And if I plot the fibers, the ECM, it goes up and down. And why does it go down? Because the tissue dissolves all the fibers eventually, and that's it. And so we have this uh, phenomenon of the little superficial scar that went away. And as you said, the time scale, even this is two, two days, this is two weeks. We're going to understand that in a second. What that is. But let's see what happens when we have uh, uh, longer inflammation. So let's, let's make it three days. Just one more day. One more day. This time, they make it over the separatrix. And now they're in a new country. Okay. Now they're over the mountain and they're rolling in another direction. And what happens is macrophages collapse, but they don't go to zero and then they go up. 
This dynamics here is very slow. So they go up over months. They go up, down, and the and the ECM. So we have a scar. And it perpetuating because they're feeding each other. Cofactors are staying there. <coughs> If we have a series of brief scars, this is the first scar. It can't cause, it doesn't make inflammation. But if it, within a week or so I have another injury, see what happened? Now my initial condition isn't here, it's here because of the previous injury. And then you get a trajectory like this, without a crashing even, potentially. So you can have two ways to get to this. One with the crashing of the macrophages, the other without the crashing. It depends on where you enter the, the basin. So this recurring injury, you might get a situation which looks like that. And you can have uh, faster scarring. This is recurring. So you can have different kinds of maturation processes. The, now if I ask, what is the critical amount of inflammation I need to cross the separatrix, okay, I can see that the critical period is something like 2.5 days, where you just cross. And it's like a first order phrase transition. If you plot the amount of time the inflammation takes and the end point of the scar, This is the window, or uh, duration of inflammation. And this is final steady state uh, scar. At 2.5 days, there's a jump. Okay. So you cross the window, this is the window, a therapeutic window to get rid of inflammation. Can I explain myself? And why, so we starting to answer, right? So we have, we can understand why fibrosis, if the injury is prolonged, recurring, large, what is the origin of this time window? We can ask, what about the long time scale? Why does it, uh, the cells turn over in, in days? Why does it take almost a year for the scar to mature? Where does the slow time scale come from? And the answer is that in certain situations, both in healing and in, in fibrosis, you go close to this unstable fixed point. And that unstable fixed point, by definition, at the fixed point, there's no motion. That's why it's a fixed point. So close to the fixed point, the wind is blowing very slowly. So if you go down, like in both cases, both in this direction and in this direction, you go close to this unstable fixed point. And here, if I plot little dots for each day, it kind of slows down here a lot and then starts picking up here and here. So you can spend mo months near this area. And it's a little bit like you can think, you know, sometimes we think like a, a ball rolling on a hill. It goes here, he, it just stops here and then goes down here. So this is like, if it rolls back, it stops and goes back. It's something like this. That's slow down. And these numbers, they said 100 molecules per minute, 1,000 molecules per minute for endocytosis and the turnover of time of days. And these equations give you maturation time of months for fibrosis and, and weeks for the, a couple of weeks for the healing. So, that's, so we can say we can understand this. And finally, can we, in principle, avoid or reverse fibrosis? So how does this picture relate to interventions that can help fibrosis. I just want to say, fibrosis evolved, it's not a mistake, fibrosis evolved because so, in some situations if, the, if there's like a, imagine there's a foreign particle in the body or some uh, pathogen like a bacteria that you can't get rid of, the body likes to encapsulate them 
and like we do sometimes to a nasty memory maybe we want to put it away. So encapsulate them in this little like in a pearl, right? Like the oyster does to a little grain of sand to make a pearl. Okay. So you want to encapsulate it and or heal up the tissue. You have an emergency, you don't want a hole here, you need to heal up the tissue so it'll work. So, so fibrosis is very good in certain situations, but uh, as we said, there's excessive fibrosis. Oh, by the way, now you can ask yourself, based on the last three lectures on aging, why are many aging-related diseases fibrotic diseases where there's too much fibrosis, right? So now we can remember that our way of thinking about aging is accumulation of senescent cells in the body, exponential accumulation and stochastic accumulation. And you remember that senescent cells, they actually also come from he healing. In, in, in all this process I didn't draw, some of those myofibroblasts become senescent and they do nice things. For instance, they call in the immune system. They're part of this thing that calls in the immune system, macrophages, neutrophils. When your whole body is full of senescent cells, not because of injury, but because of mutations of the stem cells, it's like you have injury all over and you have inflammation all over. It's called chronic low-grade inflammation, inflammaging. So that means that when you all age, a little transient inflammation that would have gone up like this and then down like this gets a little extra push because it's on the background of chronic inflammation. So there's a little more. And that means that you get more things that would normal little micro injuries so would normally heal become fibrotic. So there's a tendency to cross this subprojects so more and more with age. That's the general idea of how is it that this global um, problem that removal of senescent cells gets saturated and you have too much senescent cells all over our body with very different, different between different individuals leads to, can destabilize or can, can throw a wrench into an otherwise perfectly good process by making it just tip over because of its multi-stable nature, push it and it just tips over into catastrophic effects. So we have fibrosis here, 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 here. And tissue function declines, declines, declines. Kidney function declines, declines, declines. Heart function, muscle function. <coughs> such is life. And it's getting suchier and suchier every day. All right, so what can we do about fibrosis? Right, let's end up end on an up note. <laughs> Philosophically, without this decline, uh, we would have much less poetry in the world. Separatrics, hot, we, we call it hot and cold fibrosis. We like to say hot fibrosis because it's full of immune cells, and cold fibrosis because this, is, this kind of fibrosis also exists where it's only fibroblasts and no immune cells and that's a bad fibrosis full of fibers. Fibrosis, transient, prolonged, recurrent, the slowdown. And now let's talk about targets. Let's take an exit cell relief. Let's see what we can do about uh, fibrosis based on this picture. Based on this picture. So how can we, when we have an understanding like that, use it to think about targets. What is targets? Targets means um, a biological entity that you can manipulate usually using pharmacologically using drugs. So if, for instance, if you know it's a certain receptor you want to make it less active or something, you can design a small molecule as a drug that like a lock and key fits into that receptor and blocks it for example. That's a classic approach. So if you have molecular targets like that you can think about drugs that do things. And when you have a certain, so when the advantage of having a circuit like this is that it can point you which of these parameters, A, B, E, gamma, P1, D1, is the Achilles heel of this particular bistability we want to avoid. And it gives you uh, ideas about where to um, Achilles heel, so in the Iliad, is a nice place for the Greek warrior, Trojan, Trojan? Yeah, but who was the Achilles was on the side of the huh? of the Greeks. So it's a nice place for the Trojan soldier to aim, right? Because 
I think that what happened because Achilles was uh, dipped into something, and the person who dipped them held their didn't dip Hector. their huh? Hector. Hector, what was killed him? Or? Yeah. Well, he was, he was charged. Okay. Anyway, that's Greek mythology. We're dealing with hard science here. This is not mythology. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and anyway. We want to understand, okay, so when you have equations, the nice thing is that it's not like, it's, it's like a whole families of, it's, it's biological processes, you can, you can try to think what biological processes, do. I especially want to tune in order to get rid of, um, of the effect, or to amplify it, okay. So the idea is like this. Oh, erase the circuit. I have to redraw the circuit. Okay. So the idea is this. Um, this is our phase portrait. Now we're here. In order to avoid fibrosis, we want to enlarge this basin. So more situations flow back to the off. Enlarge the basin to the off state, which is the healing state. So, how can we do that? So, mathematically, we had our null clients. And this decline here. is due to, or uh, uh, what I want to say is this, maybe I'll, I'll say it more biologically, you can also say it methodologically, this decline is due to the autocrine loop, the autocrine loop where F makes its own rho factor. F makes its own rho factor, is what allows fibroblasts on their own to stay. Remember that? If I dial down this autocrine loop, the F makes less of itself. What happens is that they're less able to sustain themselves and they need more of them to sustain themselves. These two points start moving towards each other. And when I dial it a little bit more, they annihilate. And this null client becomes like this. And this two fixed points vanish, and we have a situation like this. So if, as I dial up, as I reduce the autocrine loop, at some point, I know I, the, the basin abstraction becomes big, and there's no more of these fixed points. And it's not only the autocrine loop, it's in fact a whole combination of parameters here that does that. And the combination of parameters is the autocrine loop times the death rate of the fibroblast divided by the endocytosis of the fibroblast proliferation rate. This has to be less than one for this fixed point to vanish. This is the autocrine. This is F death. This is F proliferation. And this is endocytosis by F. So it's all about the F. I don't have to tune it to zero. I just need this combination of parameters to become smaller than a critical number. And then a six day inflammation, not a two day, still stays here. Yeah? Oh, great. Th thanks very much. This is, I, I wanted to do it and I forgot. In what I'm doing here when I'm changing this parameter is if it's, it's, I can, for example, uh, the I, I has to be, it has to be, it's P here, right? What? P over. 
Yeah, so Miri invented this formula, so we have the expert. How, how often does it happen that a teacher has the expert? Like, uh, I don't know the answer to your question, but I happen to have uh, Enrico Fermi here, so. <laughs> then, is this right? So, autocrine times prolif? So these are like pro F and these are anti F, right? Yeah, that makes sense, right? So more F and less F. Right? So more F has to be less than the less F factor. Right? Ah, okay. So the, 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 the so what do we, yeah. So changing this parameter, for instance, increasing death rate, if I increase it too much, there's no solution anymore, only the zero. Or if I uh, do something like uh, increase uh, the, 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 the prolifer A or something, I get that the hill now goes below this line. So that's, that's the flavor of it. So you, you have only one fixed point. So you see, anyway, having three fixed points is kind of fine tuned, right? And if you change this line up, or the, if you change the hill down, you lose the three points. And you have just one point. Hope this graphics. So thanks for asking, because this is a great way to explain it. It's basically, yeah, the great way to explain it. Yeah. Uh, Hold on for a sec. All right, so, uh, so that's, that's preventing. That's to prevent. So six day inflammation leads to healing in this example, for example. So we prevent. We prevent what otherwise would become fibrosis. It's still a large perturbation will still give us fibrosis. Uh, we don't get rid of this off sta on state so quickly. What about reversing fibrosis? Oh, maybe I should just say, what am I talking about here? So in this circuit, we have the autocrine loop, and we have the, the death rate, and we have the proliferation rate, and we have the endocytosis rate, right? So we want to increase the death rate, increase the endocytosis rate, decrease the autocrine rate, and decrease the proliferation rate. Any combination of these will, will do it. Okay, so we have a big arsenal at our disposal. All right. Now, what about reversing fibrosis? Reversing, reversing fibrosis. So by the way, this was thought to be not possible, but recently medical opinion is beginning to change because it turns out that in fact, in cases like hepatitis infection of the liver where the virus gets encapsulated by the fibrosis, it's tough and indeed can lead to serious kidney liver failure. There's now a revolution in antiviral drugs that can now actually remove the virus completely. So before it was more like keeping it uh, in a steady state. And, that, and people get cured. That's a new uh, kind of development. And usually after you get cured, you don't do a liver test to see if you still have fibrosis. But doctors have done it for the people who are cured. And they were surprised to see that the fibrosis uh, vanished by removing the injury. So it's now thought that in some cases fibrosis can be reversed. Things are changing. And so how can you do that in this model? So suppose we do our manipulation on these parameters and now our situation looks like this. So we have these two fixed points basically. There's an unstable fixed point here also. I mean the unstable fi this unstable fixed point moves here. But that's a detail. You first do this. And then you deplete macrophages. Before, if you depleted macrophages, it was not a good idea because you flow to that super fibrosis state. <coughs> and experiments show that. So macrophages are confusing. They're sometimes pro fibrosis, sometimes anti fibrosis. In this situation, where you deplete macrophages, you lose the part of the tissue that's actually degrading the fibers, and the fibroblasts can maintain themselves and you get super fibrosis. But once you get rid of this, uh, this fixed point, you flow to zero. So the prescription would be to manipulate, increase so the anti-F factors, then deplete, kill macrophages. And you need to kill them all. Huh? You need to kill them all. Yeah, you need to kill them all. I want to say that in more sophisticated uh, models, 
or do not, actually, you don't need to kill them all. You just need to cross this suppression. Because you see, now the basin, our basin is this whole thing here. So I, I, you're right, I drew kill them all, but it's enough to kill them here. This is a whole basin of attraction. The separatrix is now includes an uh, area of a small amount of M. Yeah. Did I explain myself? Okay. How can you change those factors? Huh? How can you change those factors? Ah, yeah. How can you practically change those factors? Okay. So, uh, well, I'll tell you what people do, uh, in fact, in dermatology. Um, there's a kind of, in dermatology, uh, there's two major kinds of scars. Uh, one's called hyperproliferative scars, and they look like this cold fibrosis. They don't have uh, a lot of macrophages. And then there's keloids. Keloids are nasty scars. They're like living tissue. And if you cut a piece of them, they grow back. So they're nasty. And they occur where, where there's recurring injury, et cetera, et cetera. How do you, tr so if you surgically remove them, you can't get them all. You get a little piece of on state tissue, and it just grows back. They're not good, not, they're refractory, they're, I don't, surgery is not, not very effective. But what is effective is the following. You, first you do what's called cytostatic treatment, which means you do something that slows cell proliferation to them. You can irradiate them, poison them with bleomycin, do all these kinds of things. And in that situation, it's known that the fibroblasts are quite resistant to death, but macrophages are more sensitive. But, and then you, surgi you surgically remove them, and then they come back less. So the idea is that you, sl you with this um, treatment, what you do is you slow down F proliferation, and then, and you, and you kill macrophages, and then you remove the tissue, you have a little piece of it, but that little piece of it is, in terms of density, is here, and then it flows here. So that's, that's an example. So if you want to target the autocrine loop, for example, then you need to figure out what is exactly the growth factor. So you can say PDGF alpha. So if it's PDGF alpha, you say, okay, I, want, I have the PDGF alpha receptor. It's different from the PDGF beta receptor. I can build a small molecule that cleverly binds that uh, receptor and does something to it, like it prevents PDGF beta alpha from binding and, and yet doesn't cause signaling. So, or it causes that receptor to be more internalized or something like that. And so that's the way you can target an autocrine loop, for example. Or if you want to target um, um, if you want to target the production of that thing, you can, you understand, there's like, m once it's molecular biology, you can design the intervention, that's, that's the whole field of pharmacology, and it gives you ideas what to do. And, all right, uh, yeah? Another parameter is the carrying capacity. Oh, good, so what about the carrying capacity? That's great, yeah, good idea. So, uh, what, what do you expect would happen? It'll change up the height of the lift. Ah, yeah. So the carrying capacity, if you move it here, here, for example, then you lose, then you only have the opposite. So, indeed, that's a great idea. I mean, again, I didn't think about it, but there are manipulations that can change the carrying capacity. For example, it could be due to a growth factor supplied by the environment. Then you can block those receptors. Imagine. No fibrosis. It's easy if you try. Just dial down the autocrine loop and help those myofibroblasts die. Imagine all the people living. Woohoo! This completes our lecture number eight. I hope you enjoyed it. What? Proliferate. Proliferate. <laughs> I'll see you all in part three. Huh? 
May you stay scar free. Hey. Thank you.